Hey, I'm Steven and I make fonts. And today I'm going to be doing a quick video that's a little bit almost like a note to myself as much as I hope it helps somebody else uh, with kerning. Jumping in quite a bit later actually to say that this is a video I had recorded kind of in the lead up to the release for Namesans version 0 0.11. And that's now available on future fonts with lots of upgrades like these kerning improvements and more that happened actually subsequent to this video. I guess I think it's potentially interesting or fun for people to uh, see me struggle through some of the sort of nitty gritty technical details of type design. And uh, if you find that interesting, keep watching. Hope you're having a great day. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, how to organize my thoughts here. I'm, I'm doing this a little bit off the cuff, but I have the project named Sans, which I've talked about a lot on this channel, and it is my interpretation of the New York City subway mosaic uh, name tablets that are gorgeous. And going from an abstract concept like that to a real font that works really well takes a lot of time, so it's taken me a long time. And one of the things that's been a big challenge is kerning. Uh, kerning is very easy to understand at a simple level um, and quite hard to do well, in my experience at least. Um, so, you know, the classic example of kerning, if you're watching this, I'm guessing you're familiar with it, but um, yeah, let's make it really obvious. Uh, if you have kerning, letters are meant to look like equally spaced and nicely rhythmed. Um, if you turn off kerning, where is it? It is a uh, open type feature. This is a, a program for Mac called Font Goggles, really good font preview uh, tool. And if I turn off kerning, uh, yeah, you can see that the letters look pretty silly um, next to one another. So yeah. I obviously want kerning, um, especially for this font because the display styles are pretty tightly spaced for like high impact. And I think it looks really beautiful. Um, so yeah, kerning is necessary, but there are challenges with kerning this font in particular. Um, if, and I'll just kind of show this as I go up, like, okay, light to bold, no problems with some things overlapping a bit. Um, there was actually a jump there a little bit, which isn't isn't really a problem, but isn't quite what I want. So I'm going to look at improving that. Um, and yeah, basically though, as you get too high up, you can see these are almost about to crash. And I don't want the T to overlap the Y. Uh, this font is in a style called type not touching, sort of, um, kind of especially made famous in, I think, the 1970s in New York ad agencies and places like Herb LeBallon's studio. Um, yeah, so basically when it gets too bold and those things become too close, I want them to jump out of the way so that it never quite touches. It gets really close, but uh, doesn't overlap. So yeah. So that is one challenge. And another challenge is diacritics. So some languages, not really in English so much, but um, some languages will have things like um, TA, di diuresis, a diuresis as a combination that occurs. And so obviously you can't kern a diuresis as tightly as just A, because there's things on top and you don't want them overlapping and touching. So yeah, how do we deal with that? Well, it becomes a lot less of a problem in say, smaller optical sizes. In text, you don't want kerning that's very tight at all, really. Um, a lot of text fonts have almost no kerning, sometimes no kerning, and you wouldn't really notice at text sizes. Um, by the way, this is the sort of thing that, 
you know, the majority of people don't notice at all unless it's in like a logo, maybe. Um, but as a type designer, I want to make things that are really good, not just somewhat good. Um, so thinking deeply about kerning makes sense. Let's see. So, um, yeah, at high optical sizes, I want to control these jumps and I want the basic combos like T, no accent A, to have tighter kerning than the general T, A, uh, you know, combos um, can have. And um, let's see, to explain the mechanics of this a little bit, Partly I'm going to be showing how I approach this in metrics machine, which is a kerning extension for RoboFont, where I've made most of this font. Uh, and partly, as I said, this is almost a note to my future self, because I guarantee you, this is kind of a complex approach to kerning. And I might come back in five weeks or five months or five years and wonder what the heck I did here. Uh, because I've kind of had to figure this uh, system of T kerns out in a way that isn't necessarily intuitive. Uh, it's not rocket science, but uh, it took some time to figure out. And each time I do figure out and then go away, uh, I sometimes end up finding errors later. And I've really tried to be more deliberate about ironing out all those potential gotchas, um, more methodical this time. Uh, and I think I'm getting really close. Um, so yeah, to explain what's happening, we have, let's just look at TA only, or T and TA. And we'll even do this. I'm kerning lowercase against caps because sometimes logos like my company name uh, have no space but a lowercase and cap. So right. Um, The first thing is uh, a variable font can jump, um, which is to say if something like a Q can no longer fit a tail in the middle, it can change to a different version. So this is very common in fonts, variable or not, that the boldest versions suddenly have no tail in the middle, but the lighter versions do get a tail. This also happens in uh, the dollar sign, typically, I'm saying nothing about you know try, not trying to say anything about Quakers specifically. We'll we'll say Quaker oats. Um, right. So the dollar sign loses its uh, middle bar when it becomes too heavy to fit that. And this is another thing that most people don't notice unless. You know, if a bar were there, you would notice because it'd have to be super thin or it'd be entirely black or something pretty weird looking. So yeah, this happens with uh, an open type feature called RVRN often, and you just define that in the design space. So uh, uh, let's see, let me find the right design space here. Oh, wait, design space, please. Um, this is not the one I want, actually. I've got a few going in here. Um, this is pretty much perfect. OK, so here's a design space. And yeah, sneak peek, by the way, I am kind of starting to work more seriously on name mono and still in an experimental phase. But I'm coming up with some ideas that I like quite a bit. Um, so let's find that Q open. Right. So basically, we set up a rule in our design space that is like, let me really blow this up just to show off the type. Wait. There we go. Um, oh, gosh. I thought I could get rid of the. <laughs> OK, there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we set up uh, a rule, and the name doesn't actually really matter. And we set up a condition set. You can have multiple condition sets, but basically 
uh, the condition set says like between weight 728 and 1000. Um, and here it covers the entire optical size range. Uh, so basically anytime it gets above bold, which is 700. Um, and I try to set these cutoffs like between styles rather than really close to them. Um, a few letters like the O slashes and Qs lose their inner tails. And then the dollar does it a little earlier, just above medium weight, because there's less space uh, for that bar to exist in. So the dollar and cent change to an open form more early. Um, oops. Uh, OK. And right. So now that I've kind of defined the whole thing, this is all to say that TATN uses that same logic where TN is kerned really tightly. So there's this overlap or overhang. Uh, and then actually, the ultra styles get a T that is drawn the same and spaced the same, but kerned more loosely. Uh, and we swap to t dot ultra, kind of right in here, just above the extra bold weight. Um, so let me find that t dot ultra. Yes. Um, yep. There's weight mapping, so uh, this happens. You know, on the boldest end of the spectrum. And it doesn't happen for all optical sizes because it doesn't need to. Um, so yeah, actually, we could probably look here and see where it kind of goes before, basically between the display style, which is up here, and the standard style, which is down here. Um, it does, it kind of goes away. Um, yeah. And then if we have an instance like this, um, the kerning really doesn't change at all. There's no jump because it's already kind of further away to allow for these diacritics. Um, yeah, and what is the other thing? Yeah, I'll, I'll actually give like a demo of a couple of tools that have been helpful, especially in this most recent round, and I'll try to share some of those. But um, let's see. So basically, yeah, you can see that font goggles shows you that we are at t glyph here and then that jumps to t dot ultra uh just after our extra bold weight at 800. um yeah so let's see the way i'm being more methodical this time about kind of evaluating how this system is working is that I've made a drawbot script to proof it more specifically. So in the past, you know, I would do some basic proofs like putting it between the lowercase and I just wasn't very methodical. Uh, I was kind of like, you know, watching what would happen in a basic proof. But more recently I found uh, kind of a variety of characters that can occur next to a T in Latin languages, Latin script languages. Um, and there's no sense in proofing every possible glyph next to a T if it doesn't really occur in actual language. Um, yeah, so I kind of limited it to that a little bit. Um, and yeah, this is a drawbot document. So I think I'll put this up on GitHub gists and I'll link to that in the description if I do. But basically, yeah, this just has a very simple um, function to put a separator between a, a string of characters that's passed in, and it returns that as a new string. Like so, it's like T A T B T C T D T E, etc. Um, yeah, then this sets up a text document, uses a formatted string, so I can do things like setting. Um, font variations for each kind of intersection I care about. And I've listed those here, um, which is not every single instance, because that would be 72 instances, which is 
sort of more than I need to actually know what's going on. Um, and so, yeah, more pages is not always helpful. Uh, yeah, this also adds in a few like of the alternates. Um, but basically, if I run this Python file in terminal, it computes it pretty quickly. And let's see, here I am with the very latest one. And the main issues occur usually in the display. And I might not, I might even like remove, let me do that. I'm only gonna proof the display to make this a little bit more manageable. Um, yeah, so let me run this again. And here, this is a little better. Um, yeah, and so it outputs this, uh, you know, it's labeled, here's a lightweight, so it's probably not much of a problem. Um, you know, some of these get a little close for comfort, but they're pretty okay. Um, if somebody like is really setting this Vietnamese A before it, uppercase T, like maybe they'll have to do a bit of custom kerning or like if you are doing that for a logo or something and you want me to adjust the font to fix it, I will. But the main thing I'm really looking for is like the top few here to be decent. Uh, and then of course I want these to be especially good because those will occur most often, um, I think. Uh, and yeah, so yeah, basically it jumps. It's hitting a little bit here. Uh, so I might fix that. But yeah, I'm pretty happy to see that like for the most part, um, and we can see this jump. And I'm just like previewing in Mac preview and then doing option up down arrows to kind of go through the pages. So that's a pretty nice way to navigate this. Um, yeah, and then I'm looking at the italics as well. So, all right, so let's actually get into the metrics machine workflow of this because that's what I need to remember and what is kind of helpful. Um, let me do one thing, which is shut my secondary screen because this works better when you only have one display going. Um, I'll pause this. So right, here's metrics machine. This is not intended to be a from the ground up tutorial of metrics machine by any means. Um, honestly, if you are looking to use metrics machine for the first time, it's very valuable to actually read the manual, which you can get from metrics machine help. Um, you know, the main workflow is that you, uh, organize things into groups and by the way, don't try to be clever about your groups. Um, yeah, well, I, I don't know. I don't want to give a bunch of advice, but basically like if the right side of the E is somewhat similar to the right side of the O, but it's a different shape and you're doing especially a fairly tight fitting font, do not group them together because that'll just cause more headaches in the future. Um, that's going, that's like assuming <laughs> I've spent, you know, I've gone in one video from defining what kerning is very basically to assuming that you know what groups are. I don't know how in depth to get, but basically a group is a thing that you, yeah, if you are going to use metrics machine, read the manual, seriously, it's really helpful. Um, yeah, most of the answers can be here, but this for instance is a group preview. So if we want to, let's do a simpler one. VA is the standard current. If we current VA, we also want all of the variations of A to be current against V. Um, or even better, like the variations of T to be grouped against, uh, current against the variations of A. So even like T, uh, what is this, comma accent, and is that Karen or circum, probably Karen, against A. Uh, circumflex, you know, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, we don't want to kern a billion things. So by grouping things together, we can be a lot more efficient. And here's where it gets kind of interesting. And what I actually want to say about this workflow. Um, well, one shout out to Connor Davenport for this excellent script, which will link up 
multiple metrics machine windows. So when I move through it, I can have like my upright and my italic going together and it kind of keeps them in sync. So I can see and fix if say the italic is behind on a pair and or vice versa. Um, and it's really hard to keep kerning in sync sometimes. So this kind of thing is very helpful. Here's a great example. The M is overkerned versus the N. So I mean, I'll just fix this at a basic level and then kind of try to define better what I've done. And by the way, okay, first, gosh, yeah, it's always so hard. I am going to fix this because I really don't want to forget to fix it. Okay. Nice. All right. And here's actually a really good example. Usually the M and N are grouped together. And so usually changing the kerning of the N would have already affected the M. But this is one of the complexities in this font because I don't want to kern the, say, T, N, tilde as tightly as the TN um, because it would crash into the tilde. And I don't know how many people are going to do this combo, but th that's a good example of where I want there to be pretty light kerning against the actual full TN group, um, but stronger kerning against just TN only. Um, so here's what I can do. I can use what's called an exception for kerning. And exceptions are a thing that took me a while to wrap my head around. But basically, you do your general kerning. So generally, T and T ultra are in a group. And that's why these are duplicated here. Um, I wish I could make these previews bigger. I don't think I can. And so the general kerning is you know, there, uh, but, and there quite prominently, it's 100 units, so that's significant. Um, 50 units in a normal 1000 UPM font. Um, but yeah, it's not as intense as this. So to make this work, I'm using exceptions. And actually, because of this preview, I can see that I could be slightly smarter with my exception here. Um, there's three possibilities for an exception. There's literally just the single pair. So literally just T against literally just N and only those two glyphs get that kerning, even if they're in groups and the groups aren't affected, or you can kern like the left group against just the right glyph or vice versa, just the right group against the left glyph. And this took me forever to realize, but metrics machine actually tells us what kind of kerning exception is happening here if one is happening at all. So, you know, let's uh, look at a non kerning exception thing. It's just like gray and blue. So, yeah, that means that. Oh, interestingly, let's. Okay, so if it's blue and blue, they're both in groups. If it's gray and blue, it's an individual glyph against a group. So back to our TN example, if they're both red, this is an exception for both glyphs individually. Uh, so we can see here that like, um, let me pull up space center so I can show this bigger. But uh, let's see, like T Karen N doesn't have much kerning versus TN does. Right, that's a better preview than this guy. Uh, so let's break the exception. Uh, first of all, I do Command I to see my shortcuts in Metrics Machine, and break exception is Command Option E. So let me do that, and I'm going to remember that this is negative two twenty five because it'll go away once I break the exception. Now I want to make an exception, which is Command. Oh, just Command E. Okay. And I actually want to do the, oh, wait, 
<laughs> this is reminding me why I'm not doing the entire T group. This is a hard thing to remember. And this is why I'm making the video. If I did the entire T group, suddenly T.ultra would get the same exceptional kerning uh, as the normal T. And the whole point of having T.ultra is that it's loosely kerned. Um, but otherwise stays the same. God, I, I like almost need a diagram to really show this uh, because it, I'm sure it's hard to follow. Um, <sighs> yeah, as, as an example, I think let's do kerning T group against just the letter N and I'll break this in a moment, but right. We see that blue is a group for T against red, which is just an individual glyph. Let's break this and set just the T N as only the, the two glyphs that get the exception. And then we'll move it back to negative 225. And here we're back. And so, yeah, if I type what, what would people even here? SpongeBob text. No, I'm not. <laughs> I don't know. Um, SpongeBob text. If you want really well kerned SpongeBob text, name sans, aims to please. Um, SpongeBob text is from the meme where it's mocking SpongeBob if you're unfamiliar. Um, God, this is so hard to define. And this, like, I'm stumbling over it. This is the same mental process I go through each time I, like, go and refine these things. Because for me, at least, it's quite a bit of complexity to keep all in mind. Uh, maybe if I did this, like, a hundred times, I would start to <laughs> be really familiar enough with it to keep it all in mind. But the main thing I'm doing here is just like going through and I want an exception of just the base letters T against E because in, you know, probably 95% of the time these are important. It's going to be in a logo without accents. And as soon as you introduce accents, it'll be a more edge case. And the kerning still is good, you know, in the way that a typical font would be kerned. Um, but you know, if you're really trying to do T Karen against E or T Karen against E acute, then if you're making a logo, you might have to do a bit of manual kerning as you would have to do in literally any other font, I think. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> this is a strange video, I think, but the highlight is knowing about how to use kerning exceptions is kind of tricky um but at least knowing that like a it, it only really gives you the proper interface right now if you have a single display running so that's kind of a weird unexpected thing um and it's useful to know what these colors actually mean in metrics machine because uh, for a long time i was not really sure of it here's another instance where this is current a little more tightly than I think I want it to be. So I'm actually going to loosen the entire T group against the entire A italic group so it can better match kind of the rest of things. All right, there we go. And I'm going to do that here as well. Um, and A italic against T has an exception so that this exact combo is... Uh, current nice and tight oh, oh god and then there's italic 2 which also needs ex exception because it's required for some open type features um, so I'm going to add an exception here for just these two and match the T A italic which is 325, I think, which is a little tight. I think it should be more like T-O. 
So I'm going to do 270. Uh, for both of these. Ooh, it's storming out. I don't know if you hear that in the audio, but spooky. Um, yeah, I think I've complained about this before, but it's pretty tricky to get kerning, I mean, in italics, because it suddenly changes all the assumptions. And then we don't want this to be too tight. That's probably about right. Maybe a little tight. Um, because what is T ultra italic? Oh, it's that. What is T ultra D? Okay. That's a little tight. I'm going to loosen it just a bit. I think that's better. So 160. And the, here I'm doing the entire group actually. And then if I go back to A italic. Okay, good. These two are in a group, which is thank goodness. Yeah. So all of this complexity is why it's so important for me to proof it. Um, what did we do for T ultra D just now? 160. Okay. Uh, yeah, so you can see that I'm still working through some of these things, honestly. Um, and these are exceptions. These are not, yeah. And let's see what those kind of issues show up like, because basically in our page of weight 700, yeah, you can see here, for instance, that um, like this BT is pretty tight and this TD is pretty tight versus say the TC or the TO. Uh, yeah, so the goal is since I fixed these two, I will do another build here and check that it worked. And then, by the way, once we get up higher, it should snap to the T Ultra and the problem is no longer there. So. Let's see. Yeah, I guess it'd be nice to find other places to fix up, but sometimes things have to be fairly methodical. I guess this T wide ultra is one other thing I'll probably fix here. Um, because I want it to be really similar to T V which is 235. It's an exception already, which is good. And y dot bold should match y. Okay, so that is what we needed to do. Five. Yeah, that's the annoying part with all these exceptions. It's kind of challenging to keep them in sync. Maybe I should make like a, uh, I probably should make a script to help out um, with some of these things. Because otherwise it's just very challenging to keep it all together. I mean, if it's not 100% perfect, I'm also kind of mostly okay with it. 
Um, oh, this is interesting. It should be an exception here, and it's not yet. So I'm going to make an exception for just those two. And then let's kern the group a little less um, strictly. Um, See, t ultra is minus 15, so t should be minus 15 as well. It's a lot less. Yeah, okay. So I think I got it all sorted. Let's check real fast. And then, so I'm gonna make clean and make variable font, run through my build here. Okay, so this built and I wanna go and test it to be sure that it actually worked as we hope. Uh, where was the issue? It was like page 14. So this is the latest, right? 1229, yes. And oh, this is the, right? Oh, I've skipped a step. <laughs> I This is so easy to forget. Um, I need to also uh, update the variable font in this proofing, maybe I should, let me do this in a slightly smarter way. Um, sometimes it's good to have the font in there, but sometimes like now it just messes with me. So I'm gonna just get the relative path here and then let's update it here. And let's see if that fixes it. Okay, so back to page 14. Yes, okay, nice. We can see that our round of revisions did in fact make this BT and TD look a lot better. And it also evened out the TY.ultra. So that is good news, um, yeah. Let's make sure that that also happened in the normal upright bold. Yeah, this is looking good. This is looking good. So kind of a bit of a long explanation there. And I don't know if that helps anybody but me, but if it helps me, well worth making a video about it. Um, and if it does help anybody else, that's amazing. I hope so. Um, yeah, but there's just an insight if you've if anybody has managed to stick around for this, uh, there's an insight into how kerning can be a little bit tricky uh, once you get into complexities like this, but there's one way to approach kind of wrangling those complexities and making it work. So it's really about finding your methodical way to proof and then really getting a decent grasp on like how kerning exceptions work uh, and how you can use something like an alternate glyph if you need to make kerning jump. But yeah, <laughs> if you're making a font or doing any graphic design, I hope it's going great. Hope you're having a great day. Thanks a lot. Talk to you later.